my name is Tamar Sala, and um, everybody else is talking more about the external facing aspects of uh, an API and the architecture there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the internals of how you build a, a good system to support an API. In particular, I'm going to talk about this uh, kind of new craze about microservices, and I'm going to talk about how people do that wrong. So mm, quick background for myself, I'm a Unix, Ruby, Go geek um, programmer for a long time during my career, and I manage teams and manage products for Cloud Foundry. Um, when we talk about, first of all, who here knows what a microservice is? Not very many. Who here is using a microservice in their product, or believe they are? Like three or four. OK, not, not very many at all, so that's good. <clears throat> so why microservices? What is a microservices and why, why do I care? Well, first, let's talk a little bit about some history. Um, back in the day, and actually still today, uh, most systems are started as a monolithic system, which means the entire application uh, exists in a, in a single code base and is deployed and importantly scaled as a single unit. Now, that immediately leads to some problems as your application grows, as your company grows. You find that it makes it difficult to scale something like that, and more importantly, it makes it very difficult to scale the teams that are building it. So we came up with a solution back in, I think, the 90s, right, uh, called SOA, Service Oriented Architectures. And unfortunately, SOAs gave what really is microservices a bad name. And it did that because of the rampant, um, the, the, the rampant proprietary solutions and hype and consultants. And, and I was a consultant too, so I'm, I can say this, like we're half bullshit, right? Um, so basically money got in the way and then the recession hit and then SOAs have a bad name from that point on. Microservices really is just a restatement of some of the same tenants, but in a more open, maintainable, um, and modular and just practical way. Microservices, as, as I like to say, they, they enable smaller code bases, um, which means smaller teams, small focused services, so modularity. Um, teams can use the best technology for the job, which is important. It gives freedom to each one of the teams. And they can be deployed and scaled independently. So from an operations point of view, well, it can be good and bad. Um, there's some really terrible patterns that we've seen when teams build microservices. And so now we're going to talk about some of these that we see in the wild. The first one is simply to build a microservice at all. Uh, if you're starting out your, your new startup, your application, you think you're going to be the next big Twitter. Uh, which I thought was a piece of shit when it came out, so this is why I don't invest in things. Uh, if you start with a microservice, then you're already just down this road of pain. This is not the way to do things. You, you, you should be boring at all times, right? If, has anybody here read the architectural paper from uh, Instagram when they first started growing big? Really, nobody should look it up. It's a great paper. They talk about how they basically just used Postgres for everything and they were fine, right? So being boring is really good. You can scale a lot with being boring. So you should understand that when you move to a microservices architecture, it comes with this constant tax on your development cycle. It's going to slow you down from that point on. Any complexity that you add to a system is going to slow you down from that point on. So you should start with a boring application and extract. Um, when I was younger, I wrote an exception catching tool called uh, Hoptoad, now called Airbreak. Uh, and so I like to use this for examples in uh, terrible architectures because it was a terrible architecture. It was a single Rails code base here. Uh, and it had one endpoint, uh, one RESTful endpoint called slash exceptions. And basically, uh, so for background information, sorry, an exception catcher is an application that will listen for when everybody else's application blows up. When somebody else's application blows up, it says, oh, I'm on fire, it throws its error over to the exception catcher and says, okay, let me log that for you so that the developers can debug it, right? So 
we had in this one big Rails application, uh, a monolithic application, we had an exceptions endpoint that would catch all of these errors that would come from all the other applications. I'm sure you can understand that uh, that would be an immediate scaling point, right? And so the problem is, in order to scale that one endpoint, we actually have to scale the entire monolithic system, which is you know, heavy and expensive. But that's fine. That's how you start out. That is how you should start out. Uh, you should just be constantly keeping your eyes on where the next fire is going to be, and can we extract that to make it easier for us to deal with it. So then the next thing that we did was we, ext we extracted the catcher for the exceptions, and now we can scale that out light and easy, right? So that's, that's the first pattern, is simply just do it late, right? It's the agile way. And suddenly, you're building a microservice. It's organic. It's fine. Um, so another anti-pattern that I see people ignore a lot is the, uh, the issue of database schemas, right? So here we have uh, the, same the same application we were talking about before, and a database in the back end where all these exceptions are going and where the dashboard is showing these exceptions for the developers. Now, the schema for this database, let's just call it V1, it's just the set of tables and columns and such and how the database works. But what happens when we deploy V2 for the dashboard, right? Well, that deployment's going to have to update if there's a schema change, so V2 of the schema. That deployment's going to update the schema of the, of the database, which means it's immediately going to, either the dashboard app's going to explode or the exception catching app is going to explode because they're not talking the same language anymore, right? So the solution to this is what I call the gatekeeper pattern. Basically, it's a statement that no two services should be talking to the same database at any time. Now, that's an ideal. I mean, there are situations where multiple services will talk to the same database um, out of a pragmatic need for high performance. But you have to understand that when you do that, you're opening yourself up to the problem that we just had before. So now we put this um, back-end exception service in between the data store and the uh, front-end front -end applications that are using it. So this service has a much more simplified API and something that the other uh, applications can agree upon. So now you can iterate a lot more on the other applications and not worry so much about destroying the database or killing one of the other applications. But you've also kind of just pushed the problem around a bit. Because now we still have a little bit of lockstep deployment problem. These various applications are still talking to an API uh, in the back end, and that API has its own language of, 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 of its own, its own RESTful language. So here we have this situation where they're talking V1 of the API to service C, again, V1. Now, when we deploy V2 to service C, shit goes on fire, babies die, your whole system's down, because these two applications don't know how to talk V2 to this service. So then you have to deploy these two applications again, so now you've got these lockstep deployment cycles. You've got downtime, you can't do continual deployment, your developers have to worry about each time they're deploying. So when they deploy service C, they have to make sure, oh, okay, we also have to deploy service A and B, make sure that the code updates in A and B so they could talk to service C with this new V2 API. And this is going to happen every day. And then it cleans itself up. The right way of dealing with this is still painful, but it means that you can now do continual deployment. It's a semantic versioning. Who here has heard the term semantic versioning? Good, so probably about a third of you. So semantic versioning is usually used in software libraries. It's a statement uh, that the major, minor, and patch level versions of, an, of a library actually have meaning. So the major version should get bumped whenever there's a backwards incompatible change. The minor version should get bumped whenever there's a backwards compatible change, but just adds functionality. And the patch gets bumped basically whenever you want. So that means you end up with very large major numbers because every time you change an API, re remove an endpoint, um, even change how that endpoint's communicated with, you have to bump the major number. The, but it, it means that operationally, it's much easier to deal with. Here's what ends up happening. 
We have V1 running throughout the system. We deploy V1.2, and service A and B are still happy because they're talking V1, which by definition is backwards compatible or forwards compatible with V1.2, right? Now, at your, at your leisure, you can deploy new services A and B that maybe they speak 1.2, maybe they don't, who cares? Because they just need to be compatible with version 1.x, right? Now later, if we want to make a backwards incompatible change, we deploy a second service, right? A second instance of that service at a new location, and that's v2. Then we can deploy, again, at our leisure, uh, v2 of service b, for example. Now it's talking to the, to the new service, c, and then later v2 of service a, and then we can get rid of uh, the old v1 of service c which is seriously fucking painful, right? Uh, this is what your developers are gonna have to do all the time, but this is what I was saying. This is part of the inherent pain in building a microservices architecture. What you get out of this is you can scale your engineering team larger, you can scale your application much more easily, things like that. Uh, let's talk about another anti-pattern that we see a lot. Uh, spiky load between servers, between services. Now, we saw it with the uh, exception catcher, and we're going to show that a little bit more, but what you want to do is amortize your load inside your network, and generally you do that using queues. It's the easiest way to do this. Queues in between services basically smooth your internal traffic. So let's look at this exception catcher again. Here we've got a ton of exception catching instances and then just this one dashboard. It's not doing a lot of load. Um, and imagine this exception catcher as a product out in the wild where any jackass who writes some really terrible code can suddenly just 500 over and over and over again and send all these exceptions into our service. So we basically have to scale this bit like 10x what anybody else's system is getting scale for. So it's a really terrible situation to be in, you can imagine as this grows, your database immediately catches fire, right? So the way that you deal with this is you throw these exceptions into some sort of queue. Redis is a good tool for this. Um, there's a bunch of memcache is another one. There's a bunch of good queuing technologies. So that when an exception comes in, it gets thrown into this queue, and the queue can grow and shrink as you need. It might be empty, it might be close to full, and then this worker is just constantly chugging through it, one at a time, putting them into the database. Uh, maybe grabbing 10 at a time for, for efficiency, but the important thing is that it's putting things into the database in a linear time, and the buffer is the queue in between. So if it's not going as fast as the exception's coming in, then the queue just starts to fill up. The bad situation happens, of course, when you are not accounting for the the highest spike in load, and your queue actually fills beyond capacity, then you start crashing and losing instances. Another um, anti-pattern that we see very, very often is hard coding your service locations. So when you first start building a service-oriented architecture, it's very common for you to say, well, okay, I know I've got these three other services, so in my code, I'm just going to somewhere encode the fact that service one lives at this IP address, service two lives at this IP address, and, and the ports as well, right? And then when I want to instantiate a client, I just look it up in this, in this hash, and I'm good to go. Which, it's good, it starts simple, I like that. But you almost immediately run into operational problems where the, the changes to the location of your services require uh, changes to your code base, which means commits into Git, which means deployments out to production, right? So if you think that you're uh, in control of exactly where all of your services live, well, you're probably not, um, but that's, that could be fine. But then even then, you've got HA and DR issues. So what happens if your server dies and your operations person has to suddenly spin up a new server? He, he doesn't want to be making commits. You don't want to be making commits at 3 a.m., right? So you get yourself into a really bad situation with this. There's a couple of solutions. The first one we're going to talk about is uh, service discovery systems. Who here has heard of etcd or console? Okay, cool, just like a handful of you. Um, basically, 
all they are is little directories sitting out in the wild, kind of like DNS, but designed to work with service-oriented architectures or microservices. Because instead of just having the location, they also have an IP address and maybe some extra metadata, which one's master, which one's slave, stuff like that. They're basically just distributed uh, lookup services. Now, like I said, one of the keys is that they have to be highly distributed, very reliable. Um, and so we always show them in a cluster. You have a small cluster of, for this example, um, etcds, right? Now, when service A wants to talk to service B, service B has this um, IP and port combination. It doesn't know where that is, so it has to ask the, the discovery service, right? It says, hey, where's B? And the, the service says, well, it's over here. And then from that point forward, service A is talking directly to service B. If at any point service A can't connect to service B, it probably thinks, oh, maybe it moved around. So then it asks again, hey, where's B, right? So it's actually a very simple concept. There's another way of approaching the service discovery uh, problem, and that's using a centralized router in between all of your services. Now, the difference here is that while with a service discovery system, three minutes, holy crap. With a service discovery system, uh, it's only telling you where things are. With the router, it's actually proxying all traffic. So let's talk about the differences there as fast as I can. Um, both of them require registration and deregistration, HA scalability, that's of course. Um, a router is transparent and can be exposed externally, as our previous speaker talked about, which is actually a really nice thing. The problem is that it's much more difficult to build a scalable router and to maintain the, the lookup tables and things like that. Um, let's talk about dog piles. Dog piles is when one service goes down and the other service doesn't have any timeout mechanisms, right? So this is, this is bad with one service talking to another, but whatever. It's really bad when you've got all of these services talking under the one down service. So again, after that situation, you make use of something like a, uh, a discovery service. So once service B says go to hell, service A notifies the discovery service that service B is sick. And then from that point on, all the other services, after they check in with the, with the discovery service, don't, don't bother it for another 10 minutes, right? So it's kind of a centralized timeout mechanism. Uh, debugging hell. So the best solution for debugging hell, it's a very simple thing to do, is simply to, to provide consistency IDs, um, sorry, correlation IDs for every request. If somebody makes a request from your browser into your, into your front router, it should immediately tag that request, which means its outbound request gets tagged with, say, an HTTP header that says, by the way, this is the ID of this, of this session, right? All internal traffic then also gets tagged with that. And when, that way, whenever you look through your logs, you can simply grep for that correlation ID and see everything that happened within that, that request, which means if something blew up, you know who to call and apologize to, right? <clears throat> then there's flying blind, which is solved with as much graphing as you could possibly fit. Of course, you've got information overload at this point, so the hard part here is figuring out what are, your, what are the actual important bits of information you're supposed to be graphing and monitoring and logging. And then the operational explosion. The benefits of S uh, microservices is that, yeah, my wife says I have too much animation, she's probably right. Um, <laughs> the benefit is that your, your teams can choose whatever technology they want. The downside is that your teams are gonna choose whatever technology they want, and your operations people are probably gonna quit, right? Um, so, and this is where I become a shill, this is, where, this is why we built Cloud Foundry, right? So this tool basically uh, acts as a gateway between your operations people and your developers so that they can provision whatever databases they want. They can scale their app up and down. They can deploy apps without having to put extra load on the operations people, right? So in summary, start boring, understand the hidden schemas, use queues to amortize traffic, um, discovery tools, circuit breakers, debugging tools, uh, and of course, Cloud Foundry and we are hiring in London. So thank you. Excellent.